once again, this is on our website. If you go to communitygospelnj.com, go to the Midweek Bible Study, and go to the Gospel of Luke, um, and you can get uh, the notes that I'm using here uh, that I put together. You can get that there as well in Word or PDF. So, verse 39. This is the story where Mary visits Elizabeth, and it says this, At that time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. So Mary takes this journey from Galilee all the way to Judea and and visits with uh, her cousin, visits with Elizabeth. And as soon as uh, Elizabeth hears Mary's greeting, the baby, who's John the Baptist, in Mary's womb, leaps. And as I was studying this, the Lord just brought to my mind that uh, your child, your, you know, those who are uh, pregnant, those who have a baby in the womb, that you may not be aware of this, you may have never heard of this before, but babies hear in the womb. They pick up in the womb. And when my wife and I, when we had, before we had Zoe, our firstborn, um, we used to, you know, pray over the womb, and we would pray over Zoe while she was still in the womb. And when we would pray over her, she would kick. She would kick my wife's belly, you know. Whenever she would hear my voice, she would kick, and she would do all of that. Uh, but we, we knew early on that children in the womb pick up. They pick up your voice, and, but they pick up more than just your voice. They pick up your attitudes. They pick up your words. And I truly believe that children are either loved or rejected from the womb. That a person or a family who did not want to have a child but got pregnant anyway and had that child, that oftentimes that child will grow up with a root of rejection from the womb. They feel whether a father really wanted that child or not or a mother wanted that child or not. They pick it up. From the womb, a child is rejected or accepted. And I knew that very early on with my children. And so I made it a point that I would l let ensure that that fetus, that baby in that womb, would feel my love and feel the acceptance. And I, I think that's important. And I, and I just say that to those who eventually will one day get married in here. One day you'll have children. And just know, and never forget this, that your child from the womb hears your voice, picks up your attitudes, whether they're negative, whether they're positive, they pick it up. And from the womb, they are already receiving. They're, it's, like, it's like internal radar that they have. And it's their spirit, because they're spirit beings. And then there's flesh and blood and bone all around them, but their spirit picks up. And so I say that, you know, to those who have, um, who want to get married and want to have children. And you notice here, Elizabeth, he, she, you know, as soon as Mary greets Elizabeth, the baby in her womb leaps. Woo, man. And then the Bible says she was, you know, she was filled with the spirit. And I also want to say, uh, I want to say something, you know, and, and, and she even makes mention of this in verse 44. She says, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. <laughs> well, the baby's not on the outside. The baby's on the inside. She, that baby heard. And that baby was not Jesus. That baby was John the Baptist. But there was a connection there. There was something supernatural, something spiritual there. So, but you notice he says, as soon as your greeting reached my ears, you see? So the baby picks up in the womb what words are spoken through the ear gate and down into the, into the womb. Not just from the outside, but the ear gate. 
You have gates, you know, eye gates, ear gates. You have gates. There's different gates. Your feet are considered gates, places where you go. Your hands are considered gates, things that you touch. So the enemy is always looking to get through a gate. He's always looking to find his way. Sexual organs are gates. So you have these gates. And those gates are, are you're either letting stuff in there, or either good things or negative things. And when you do certain things, when you say, you know, and your mouth is a gate. <laughs> um, so the enemy always tries to gain access to your spirit through one of these gates. And so that's why it's very careful how you, how you live your life. And it's very, you have to be very careful with the words you speak. Because what the words you speak are also speaking into somebody's gate. Words of rejection, words of anger, words of hate, or words of love. You know, can assault, can, uh, um, you know, what is it, uh, in James, talks about, you know, fresh water and salt water. Can it, can it come out of the same spring? No. He says this, you know, he goes, some of you are cursing your brother and some of you are blessing. And he says, and you have, you, you have two, two, two sources coming out of you. And he says, this, this, this ought not to be. And so you have to be very, very careful with the words that come out of your mouth. And I have found a, a prayer to be very helpful to me over the course of my life, which is, Lord, put a watch over my tongue. Put a watch over my mouth. That, Lord, next time I say something negative, you know, just let me catch it. Let me catch it in the moment. If I'm speaking negatively, if I'm speaking unclean words, let me just, just, just ooh, catch me. And the Lord will, will remind you. But it's up to you whether you're going to obey that or not. It's up to your obedience. So the second part I want to just kind of draw your attention to on uh, the womb, because this is just what was speaking to me. I mentioned this on Sunday about you're, you're destined from the womb. You're called from the womb. Um, you're not called when you turn 20 years old or 30 or 40 or 50. You're called from the womb. Your calling happened when you were inside your, your mother. That's where you're calling. That's where you were set apart. And I was thinking of Psalm 139, 13. It says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. He's saying God did this. God knitted you in your mother's womb. He said, oh, well, if God did that, why did that, the baby come out and deformed? Well, that's because, of the, because there's such a thing as called sin and, and the fallen nature and the fallen condition of things in the earth, the curse that's in the earth. And that's why these things happen. But that was, never that was not necessarily God's will for that to happen, per se. So he says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Now stop right there. The Lord just quickened to me just now. And this is what I believe He just he spoke to me. That when God is forming the body in the womb and forming the baby, that there are times and occasions where the enemy gets in there. And that's why some of these things happen. Because sometimes the enemy gains access, sometimes unknowingly. And that's why sometimes a child can be born with a certain way. And it, it, it's be, and it has to do with the fallen condition and, and, and so on. But there are times where the enemy, where a, a parent can unknowingly give access through one of the gates, so to speak. I'm being a little deep here. And then there's a, a birth defect. Oh, well, how's that possible? Well, very simply, just a parent that's doing drugs. <laughs> Smoking. It's through the gate. And, uh, and because of that, you know, it can cause certain birth defects. But that was not necessarily God's original intention. God always creates good. 
and does good, but because of sin and our sins, things happen. You see? And so it's not because God caused that child to be born that way. It's because of the sin that's in the earth. And Satan. And disease. The fall. And how all of that happens is a mystery. But God's intention from the beginning is always to do good. And always to create good. And to plant something that's good. And that doesn't mean that you reject the child if a child is a certain way or something. You love that child regardless. I have friends with children with autism and children with Down syndrome. And, you know, it's not something to make light of or to make fun of or, you know, and, it's, and, and, and I will not say that in every case it's because of the devil did it. You know, no. There are times when that's possible, but also it's just because of the fallen condition of things. So I'm just trying to show you two sides of this. You see? Because in, before sin, before Adam sinned, when Adam and Eve, if they had procreated before they sinned, and let's just say there was no sin, and there's procreation that's happening and going on in the earth, there would be no deformities. There would be no birth defects. It would be a state of perfection, right? You would agree with me on that, right? It's only after the sin, only after the fall, that there's these, these things occur, that, that birth defects happen. But never, never before the fall. If there was no fall, I'd have a full set of hair. <laughs> as some of you would too. We wouldn't die. You wouldn't die. You would, you would, li you would just, you, your, your physical body was not designed to die. It was not designed to get old and die. It's because of the fall that it does. It regenerates every seven years, whatever it is, and it gets old over time. Cells replicate and then they die out. They replicate and they, you know, and regenerate, etc., etc. Till one day, boom. So, Anyway, I don't, I don't mean to get off into all of that. But let's go on. Look at verse, uh, Psalm 139. Look at verse 16. Uh, Your eyes saw my unformed body. And now this is the part I wanted you to hear. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now just stop there for a minute. And just, I want you to chew on this. Because sometimes we read the scripture so fast that we miss out on what it's actually saying. He says, all the days ordained, this is NIV, I believe, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now, I, I was following Kevin Zadai for some time, and he said that when he met Jesus, and, you know, he had an encounter, he had died, he was in the dentist chair, and he died. And he actually got to meet Jesus. <laughs> and, he, and Jesus revealed to him this passage and talked about how that before you were born, that God had wrote your life in a book. And I remember the first time I heard that, I was like, well, that sounds really strange. Your life was written in a book until he pointed this verse out. And it says, all your days were ordained and written in this book. And so, that's, so there's a book with your name on it, in heaven. And it's your responsibility to pray, Father, as it is in heaven, so let it be done on earth. That's part of the our Father who art in heaven, prayer. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. So whatever God has written about you, whatever he has ordained for your life, God wants that to come to pass here in the earth. And here's what's beautiful about it. It was, you were destined from the womb. It's, that's why I said earlier, it's not, your calling doesn't happen when you're 20 or 30 or 40 years old. No, that's when you're starting to discover it. But your calling happened when you were, when, when you were in the womb. And look, look at some other passages. Watch this, Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed you in the womb. Now watch this. God says, before I formed you, before I made you in the womb, I knew you. God predestined your life before you ever came to be. Before your mother and father conceived. Before your mother conceived. 
God says, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you. You see, he was called. Jeremiah was called as a prophet to the nations. You say, oh, but that was Jeremiah. Well, there's other places too. Paul says the same thing. Paul says in Galatians 1.15, but when God who set me apart from my mother's womb, <laughs> his calling happened in his mother's womb. Isaiah says the same thing. This is chapter 44, verse 2. This is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb. And Isaiah then again says it several chapters later in Isaiah 49, verse 1. Listen to me, O islands. Pay attention, O distant peoples. The Lord called me from the womb. Each and every person in this room was called from the womb. Isaiah was called from the womb. Jeremiah was called from the womb. Paul was called from the womb. David was called from the womb. You were called from the womb. Your responsibility is to discover God's call on your life and to pray, God, whatever it is you have for me here, unfold it, reveal it to me. It may not be what you're doing vocationally right now. It could be, but it may not be. God might have greater plans for your life. And you need to discover that. You need to pray. You need to get with God and ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? I, I had enough sense to do that after I had gotten saved and I got back from, I, I, you know, before I got saved, I, I signed up for, I had, you know, I had signed up for the military. I had signed up to become a military police officer. And, and I, my training was in August of 1990 at Fort McClellan, Alabama. I went down to MP school. I was saved. I was maybe, oof, I got saved in Mar February of 1990. My training was in August of 1990 at Fort McClellan, and I, but by the time, between the time I was saved and the time I was going for training, I, God had just done, He had completed a radical transformation in my heart and in my life. And when I got in there, I did not want to be there. I was like, wow, this was the old man <laughs> who wanted to be there. The old me, in other words. The new me doesn't want to be here. The new creation, the born again part of me. I, I say, I don't even know why I'm here. And I just fought tooth and nail to get out of that. And long story short, I will, I'll spare you the details, but I eventually did get out. And when I got out, um, I, I didn't complete my training. And I was National Guard. I was able to actually get out. It was just a whole process. But anyway, um, but I have to say, I wish I had completed it. But anyway, that's for another time. My wife and I debate this because if I didn't get out, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today with the school of ministry and so on. But anyway, that's a, that's a whole other issue. But when I got out, I began to really inquire and to seek the mind of God and to, to seek Him where my calling was concerned. And I had enough sense to know that, Lord... I believe you have a call on my life. I believe you have something for me, but I don't know what it is. And I'm asking you to reveal to me what you have for my life. What is it, Lord? What do you want? And I began to pray, and I began to inquire. And, and like I had mentioned on Sunday, there were times where I would watch um, the TV shows, and I would watch uh, preachers, and, and then I would, or even my own pastor, and I would project unknowingly. I would see myself in their shoes and I would like see myself doing what they were doing from the pulpit and I used to shake myself and go what what is this why do I keep doing that and then over time I began to you know and I'm talking when I say time I'm talking like a you know a month or two or whatever not not that much not, not that long where I would not just see myself in their shoes but I began to desire it I began to want that and I would see myself doing what they were doing and then I would hear this little voice on the inside of me say that's what I've called you to do and to be and and then one day and I had always known this that God when he has a call on your life or when he wants to tell you something or when he tells you something he will often confirm it through other people he will confirm it um, especially your calling what you're called to. God will confirm it in multiple ways. Um, 
And so one day I was in a meeting, I was in a special service where there was this traveling evangelist and his wife, and, and it was amazing because they worked together as a team, and she would speak in other tongues, and, and, uh, or no, he would speak in tongues, he would give a tongue, and then she would give the interpretation of that. And they just worked like that. And one day, I was way in the back, and his name was Purdue. They were the Purdue's. I'm going to see them in heaven one day. And they were an elderly couple. And they were like, Rich, would you stand up? You know, that's how they talk. They had that southern drawl. And uh, so I stood up in the middle of this small congregation, and, and boy, she started, or he started, you know, going with the, uh, the tongues. <laughs> and, then, and then there was a pause, and then, and then she began to interpret. And it was the very first words were, you know, like, thus saith the Lord, you know, I have called you as a pastor. And when she said that, it was like everything that I had been already, of what was already going on on the inside of me, was, it was bearing witness now. It was being confirmed. And, uh, and then I wrote that whole prophecy down. I, I won't go into the details on it. And, uh, and then I waited on it. Because when God gives you a word, you have to wait on that word. You can't, you can't rush if God gives you a word. And that's just one way that God speaks. That's not the only way He speaks. He may never give you a word through somebody. He may just speak it into your heart and then confirm it in other ways. But that's what He was dealing with me. That's how He dealt with me. And I, and I thought, okay, well, if I'm called to be a pastor, that it's going to happen in probably, you know, six months from now. Well, it didn't happen. It didn't happen in six months. It didn't happen in six years. It didn't happen in 16 years. It was about 24 years. But I, all through that time, I was holding on to that word. That doesn't mean that there weren't discouraging times or moments, and there were plenty of that. There were times where I questioned it. There were times where I thought, ah, I probably missed it, and blah, 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 and so forth and so on. And then eventually, you know, ultimately, the rest is history. God, God fulfilled it. Um, but I say all that to say this. I was not called at 18 years old. I was called from the womb. You're called from the womb. So you need to get with God, if you haven't done so already, and find out, Lord, what do you have for my life? What do you want me to do? What is it that you have for my life? What do you, you know, and God might just tell you, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. I've had him tell me that before, at certain seasons of my life. So you've got you to gotta do what God tells you to do. So, but I just, I'm saying this because I want you, I don't want you to go through life and miss out on what the Lord has for you. And if you're elderly, it doesn't matter. God has something for you to do. Surely you can do something. Surely God's got something for you to do. And God will reveal it to you through prayer, fasting. He will show you. And um, so the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. So um, anyway, and I, I just I, and I will just say this and I'll end on this note with with that this portion that we're looking at is that one day you will give account of your life. One day. Just like our brother who just recently passed, you know, he'll stand before the Lord and he'll give account what he did in this church, what he built here, or helped build, he'll give account. And, you, you know, and I say, friends, live your life for Jesus, because life is short. It's short. You're here, you know, James says your life is like a vapor. You're here for a moment, and then you're gone. You're born from the womb, and then your life is like a vapor, and you're old. I, I can still remember, you know, my dad is up there now in years. He's in his... He's in his mid-70s, and he's getting old. He's getting older. And I still can remember, you know, as an as a eight-year-old boy, just running in the snow, playing with my father. You know, moving things, watching him move big pieces of furniture and all this stuff. And then I look at him now, and I'm like, wow, where did the time go? It's like it's gone. It's like his whole life just gone. And it's like in our lives are that way. I remember getting saved at 18 years old and thinking, man, I got all these years ahead of me. And now I wake up one day and I'm 50. And I'm like, where did it go? You know? So, you know, I, I may have less years ahead of me than, than that are behind me. 
or hopefully equal. <laughs> you know, when you're younger, you have more years ahead of you than are behind you. But when you get older, you have less years that are ahead of you than are behind you. But that doesn't mean that God just wants you to sit around and do nothing. If He was just going to let you sit around and do nothing, He'd just take you home. No, there's, there's work to be done. There's investments to be made. Kingdom investments. Find out. Find out what God has for you. Find out. You see? If you don't plug in to what God has for your life, you will have a midlife crisis. You'll end up buying a motorcycle. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But you need to find out what God has for your life so you don't have a midlife crisis. Because when you plug into God's plan for your life, that's where your joy is. That's where your happiness is. That's it, in a nutshell. Anyway, let's move on. So amazing what you can get out of Mary visiting Elizabeth, right? You never think, you know, how do you get all that out of that? Well, it's, it's pretty cool. Anyway, praise God. Let's look at verse 46. This is Mary's song. And uh, this, is, this, is called, this is actually in Latin, the Magnificat. And this, is, this portion of Scripture from verses 46 to 56 is often used as a basis for choral music and hymns. And, um, and it has a parallel to uh, the story in Samuel where uh, Hannah, the mother of Samuel, where she glorifies God and what God's going to do for her, you know, through her, you know, through Samuel, through her unborn child. Um, because you have to remember, Hannah wanted a child and and she said, Lord, if you give me a child, I'll... She couldn't have children, but she wanted a child. She says, Lord, if you give me a child, I'll give him to you. Yeah. And by the way, isn't it... I, I find this amazing. My wife, when we had Zoe and Zena, we had no... You know, I'm the only... My brother and I are the only two males to carry on our family name. And my brother doesn't have any children. God bless him. Um, but my wife and I are the only ones who have children. And we had Zoe and Zena, but there was no boy. And, but it was in my wife's heart that we have a boy. And she wanted, her prayer to God was, Lord, I want my husband's name to be carried on in his family line. I don't want, I don't want to just not, you know, for his line to, to die with him. And sure enough, right after that, we had Zion. <laughs> and I had nothing to do with it. Well, I had everything to do with it, but, you know, I, I wasn't praying. I wasn't thinking that way. I was just happy with what I had. I was happy with Zoe and Zena. In fact, at that time, I was not looking for a third child. And uh, so, but I knew that once Zion, once she was pregnant with him, I knew it would be very important that I have an attitude of acceptance towards that child from the womb. And that I did not, and that I don't have an attitude that says, oh, why do we have a third one? You know, you had to go get pregnant, or, you know, I knew it was very important that that child doesn't feel that in the womb and feel a, re a sense of rejection because I was not looking for a third child. But I knew you better, you better adjust your attitude. Make sure you, you, you love that child. And now, forget it. Are you kidding me? I, I can't, you know, I can't get enough of him. You know, it's like, I mean, I, I mean, when he was born, that was it. It was like, I'm in love with this child, you know? And um, so, but just watch that. And watch that as you, as, you, as you get married and you start having children and, you know, you maybe, maybe the first child or second child, uh, you wanted that child, you know, you want it, but then maybe the third or fourth child, you really didn't want it because it's too much because that happens with people. I'm, being, I'm, I'm speaking very deep right now. But you watch. You make sure that whatever children you have, you know that God gave them to you as a gift, gives them to you as a gift, and that you love and you accept that child from the womb because they hear it. They pick it up in their spirit. They pick it up. Just like Mary, just like Elizabeth and John the Baptist leaped in, Mary, in, in Elizabeth's womb when she heard the sound of Mary. She le it leaped at her voice. So, anyway, Mary's song, the Magnificat. <laughs> and, um, and by the way, Hannah's song and Mary's song, both here, they really, these are songs that de depict God as champion of the poor, the oppressed, and the despised. 
Okay? So look at verse 46. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermo in, inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever. Just as he promised our ancestors, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. So, let me just say this about Mary, because um, I, I, I almost feel like when we get to heaven, that we have, we have a lot of, people have a lot of apologizing to do to her. <laughs> you know, to, you could, there's so much Mary worship, and I'm sure Mary never intended for that. You know, Mary, we venerate Mary, we honor her, but we're not to worship her. Because there's nowhere in Scripture where it says to worship her. In fact, she re refers to herself as a lowly and humble servant, not someone to be worshipped. And nowhere in the New Testament does it say to worship Mary. Nowhere. You will not find one verse. In fact, those who do try to find Scripture, they commit the egregious error of what theologians call eisegesis. Eisegesis is a term, a theological term, that means to read into the text instead of reading out of the text, which is called ex exegesis, like exit. In other words, let the text speak for itself and let Scripture interpret Scripture. Let it, let it speak to you. And that's how you should read Scripture, not you reading your ideas into the Scripture. When you read your ideas and your thoughts and what you want it to say, when you read into it, that's called eisegesis. And people have done that for centuries. And so the classic verse that people point to or passage of Scripture to say that we're supposed to worship Mary is Luke eleven twenty seven, And I'll read it to you in verse 28. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave birth to you and nursed you. And Jesus replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And so how in the world do we get Mary worship out of that? Well, they'll often point to what Jesus said. When they said to her, when they said to him, Blessed is the mother who gave birth to you and nursed you. And Jesus says, Well, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. They take that to mean <laughs> that you're to, you'll be blessed if you worship Mary, <laughs> if you bless her. And so what they will tell you is that you see Jesus is saying there that you need to hear the word that he's just speaking about, which is, you know, what this word is that, that was just uttered, this blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. In other words, blessed are those who hear the word and obey it. In other words, you know, those who hear about worshiping Mary, those are the ones that are going to be blessed. And they just totally twist it and they take it out of context. It's not even saying that. And they're missing the word here. If you look at it, it says blessed rather. <laughs> see, they don't mention that. It's blessed instead. <laughs> blessed instead, blessed rather, are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Jesus was trying to tell them that, yeah, my mom is blessed. Right? But, it's those who hear my word and obey it. Those are the ones who are really blessed. That's where the real blessing is. The real blessing is in obeying, is in hearing the word of God and obeying it. That's where the blessing is. Not hearing a word about Mary, you know, or, you know in that sense. It's not, that's not what it's saying. So I say that because you all know this, but people watching, are, uh, they don't, a lot of people don't know that. I, I remember when I was in seminary, I was in a Catholic seminary, and I was probably myself and maybe one or two other people were the only so-called evangelicals, 
felt like Martin Luther from the Protestant Reformation in there. Uh, my seminary professors, I got along really well with them, but the students were mean. They were nasty. Mean. I mean mean. They did not like me at all. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I would sit, there were some that were nice. There were some, uh, especially the, uh, the foreign exchange students from overseas. I got along really well with, 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 with them, and I would have lunch with them, and and some of their buddies would ask the guys that I would sit and eat lunch with, the, the students who are studying for the priesthood, they would ask and say, why do you sit with him? Why do you sit and eat with him? Like he's an ev evangelical. You know, as if I was like I had a disease or something. <laughs> you know? And uh, it didn't bother me. I mean, I, I just, because I knew the truth. And if anything, I felt sorry for them. Because I was like, wow, you guys are like, you're in such such, you know, darkness. But I remember in seminary, I remember one of the students, he was so zealous for the, you know, Catholic faith and that's fine and all that. But he turned to me one day and he's like, you worship Mary, right? You better honor the mother of, the, of our Lord. You, you worship her, right? Right? And he was so, like, I was like, wow. I'm like, I said, I respect her, but I don't worship her. <laughs> you know, I said, you can't, where in the Bible does it tell us to do that? They can't point to it because these are traditions that have been added on and when you start building a religious system around these traditions, you ultimately nullify the Word of God. That's what we've talked about on Sunday. You know, you nullify the Word for the sake of your tradition and their traditions triumph and trump what the Word says and therefore it has no effect. So... I remember there was an old story my pastor used to tell of a, of a woman who got converted from Catholicism to, you know, I'll just call it being born again. She got, she got born again and she got on fire for the Lord. And they were having a prayer meeting one day. And so she was still new to the things of God. And they were praying and it came for her time to pray. And so they started praying and so she starts to pray and she starts to do Hail Mary, Mother of Grace, Mother of God, whatever. And so she starts to go through it and then she stops and she pauses. She goes, oh, oh, heck with it. Jesus, you know, and she went right to the top. <laughs> so, you know, Jesus is at the top. You know, the Father is at the top. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. We talk to Jesus, the triune Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's not God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and then Mary. You know, that's not, that's not, no. Or the saints. There's nowhere in the Bible that it says to pray to saints. You know, my, my pastor used to carry around this saint on his necklace all the time. I forgot his name, but he had like a broken leg, and then it had like a, the dogs were licking his sores. And uh, yeah, it was, I forgot the name of the saint. I don't know what the saint did, but he used to carry that around. And, uh, and then one day he's looking at this thing and he's like, you know, you don't look like you could help yourself. <laughs> you look like you're in worse condition than I am. And he's like, why am I carrying this thing around? So he, he put it away. <laughs> anyway, so listen, I'm not trying to mock people, but I want to point people to the truth. And Jesus is the one who we worship. We don't worship Mary. In fact, I love this. I, I wrote this down. Uh, John, the revelator, who wrote the book of John and the book of Revelation, he fell. Now, he, he spent his life serving the Lord as a young man. And when he was exiled to the island of Patmos, that's where he wrote the book of Revelation. And he was probably somewhere in his 90s. So he had known Jesus probably for 50, 60, 70 years. Who knows? Maybe 70 years he had been serving the Lord. But he has this amazing revelation where the Lord visits him, lets him go up into the third heaven and lets him see all that God's going to do and writes it down. We got, it's called the book of Revelation, right? But two times, listen to this. This is how people, easy it is to be deceived. Two times, when the angel shows him this amazing scene, it literally says that John said, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel. John, faithful disciple, beloved of the Lord, falls down at the feet of a heavenly angel to worship the angel. And it happened two times. Happened in Revelation 19.10 and Revelation 22.8. And both times the angel said this, but he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant 
with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll. Worship God. Not worship Mary. Not worship a saint. Worship God. Not a man. Not a statue. Not a relic. Worship God. But here's what, I, what was astounding to me, and, and you could just chew on it. How does a man who knows Jesus better than you and I know, spent three and a half years with this man, is in, in love with him, writes 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, writes the book of John, and has this amazing revelation and literally gets down before an angel to worship him? Two times! It happened one time, and then it happened a second time. That's how powerful spiritual things can be. That you could end up becoming led astray if you're not careful. And that has happened for centuries. So, you always want to go back to what the Bible says. Always let that be your anchor. Always let that be your, your, your compass, your guiding post. Even Paul said... He says, if an angel of light appears to you and preaches another gospel, let that angel, let, 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 let him be anathema. In other words, let him be accursed. There's only one gospel, there's only one God, there's only one Father, there's only one Jesus, only one Holy Spirit. There's only one word, and that's it. And so, that's what we go by. But that's how powerful deception is. And we see deception in, you know, in a cross. So, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, I know in Catholic Church, um, I always hear that the angels are like angels of light. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, like, what is the difference between praying to an angel and praying to God? Is that okay? Or no? You mean praying to, to an angel? Like, just kind of saying, guardian angel, don't leave my life. No, it's not okay. Okay. No. No, it's 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 almost borderline of what you know what John was doing. That's why if you read those words where he says, "Don't do that," I'm a fellow servant with you. You know what I mean? And he says, "And with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll." In fact, Colossians talks about uh, angel worship. And so once you start praying to an angel, you're committing a form of angel worship. Yeah, and he says this, and so he says that these people are led astray. So the only one you're to worship is Jesus. It's the Father. That's it. And uh, for anybody. And so, but you see, the devil is subtle. He creates these little, neat little prayers. Have the children pray it. Oh, guardian angel, keep me. You know, no. No. Guardian father. That's who you pray to. In the name of Jesus. You see? So, it, listen, if it's not in the Bible, if it's not in the Scriptures, you gotta put it aside. You know, so that's why I say let your traditions be challenged by the scriptures. Let your traditions and, and all these things that are out here, because there's a lot of it. It's gotta be challenged. You know, always let it let it line up. You know, this is the plumb line. You know, it's it's the measuring rod. Where does it where do all these things measure up against the scriptures? If you can have if it's in the scriptures, then you you know, then yeah. Uh, if it was in the scriptures, I would have to say, yeah. But if, if it's not, no. And now, what the Catholic Church will tell you is, well, we don't just follow scripture. We follow with the magisterium, the church, and we follow the ecclesiastical. They follow three. They follow scripture, they follow the magisterium, which is the church, and then they follow the traditions, the encyclicals that have been written. And so, but the problem with that is it's all man-made. You know, a lot of it. And it was stuff that happened much later. A lot of these developments that happened later. It wasn't always the case where celibacy was the case. That happened much later. They were now priests can't get married. You know, and that's why I think they're having a lot of problems that they have. They just let them get married. <laughs> you know, anyway, I don't want to get into all that. But, you know, I don't know. Hopefully I won't get any hate, hate mail on all this. But... It's, there's a lot of deception out there, just to say the least, and it's, it's really sad. And uh, friends, listen, until you've mastered the Word of God, you don't need an encyclical. You don't need a magisterium. You don't need all these things. It's just going to confuse you. You know, the one thing that I was always um, amazed at when I was in Catholic seminary, I went to a couple of different seminaries, but that was one of the seminaries I attended. It was a Catholic seminary. But I was always amazed at how very few of them knew their Bible. They really didn't know their Bible. They couldn't have a biblical conversation with you. 
You know, I mean, they could do it on the encyclicals, they could do it on the church and, and the worship, all of that, but they did not know their Bible. In fact, many of the books that we had in our biblical studies program were so watered down because the kids, the, the students couldn't understand more advanced theological books. So they had to give them books that were very like, they, they, they could not keep up with our school of ministry materials that we give because of the illiteracy. They had to come down to like almost like a Sunday school lesson for them because they just didn't know their Bible. They, they, they've been taught a lot of religion and a lot of tradition, but not a whole lot, you know. But, um, but the more advanced classes, you definitely got, it got really deep. <laughs> but anyway, so, all right, let's go on because we're, pff, man, it's, it's all your fault, guys. It's 8 o'clock. All right, let's finish this passage and let's go. So this is the birth of John, John the Baptist. And... Um, you know, let me, let me just kind of uh, read through some of this. This is, when it was time for Elizabeth, verse 57, when it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote his name as John. Immediately his mouth was open, and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wonderful, wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. And I just want to draw your attention just to a couple of things, because, um, you know, verse 59, he talks about that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. So circumcision was instituted uh, under the Old Covenant. And in Genesis 17.10, it says that, that God said, this is the covenant with you and your descendants after you. Um, that every male among you will be circumcised and you are to undergo circumcision. It will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. So circumcision was a covenant between God's people and the, uh, and God Himself. So that's where, that's where circumcision came from. It happened with Abraham, all the way back with Abraham. And it was the sign that set apart God's people from just being any other ordinary people. Um, but in the New Testament, our circumcision, biblically, happened in the Spirit, not in the flesh. Okay? That's why Paul said in Romans 2.28 that, that a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, meaning in the flesh. And he says, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. He says, no, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. So when you got born again, when you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that is the sign of, of, of circumcision. It's a sign of the covenant. That's why you who have received Christ as Lord and Savior, you will go to heaven because of that sign, because of being born again. Those who have not been born again will not go to heaven. And because they lack the sign of the spiritual circumcision, which is being born again. <laughs> so it's, it's, very, it's, 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 it's right there. So in the Old Covenant, you have to look at what are called types and shadows. You know, so these things are types. So Old Covenant circumcision is a type of New Testament being born again. That's what, that's what that is. Um, so I just wanted to kind of draw that out a little bit on, on that. I don't want to say too much about this. On, you know, the, there's a lot here that we could get into and all of that. But you know, that's, that's the, main, the main gist of it. And then we get into Zechariah's song. And you, you, can, you can read this uh, later. But he really talks about his father, Zechariah, verse 67, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. And, I, you know, I, I, well, I don't want to read the whole thing. But he talks about... Um, Israel being redeemed from their enemies. That's the gist of it. That's really what he's prophesying about. And so, but he's filled with the Spirit and he's prophesying. Now, in the Old Covenant, the Spirit, I mentioned this before, the Spirit would come upon kings, prophets, and priests. And oftentimes it would say that they were filled with the Spirit. But very rarely do you see somebody that was not a prophet, priest, or king that was filled with the Spirit in the Old Covenant. No, na most of the time the Spirit would just come upon an individual and they would do what they had to do. But very important figures, such as prophets, priests, and kings, they were not just anointed with the Spirit upon, but they also, in certain cases, did have the Spirit within. 
but that was rare. It didn't happen all the time. It's only when you get over into the New Testament, from the day of Pentecost, we see that the church, God's people, who are born again, who are, they are the ones who get filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they're able to do the works that God has called them to do. And we see that in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19, and, nine, and, and, and three out of the five times in the New Testament where the Spirit comes upon people, it's evidenced, or the symptoms, or the sign that they were filled with the Spirit is accompanied with tongues, and it's often prophecy. So when they speak in tongues, so for instance in Acts chapter 2, you don't have to turn there, verse 4, it says that when the Spirit came, when the day of Pentecost fully came, it says in Acts 2, it says, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. Now that was talking about languages. These were languages that they all heard them in their own, um, you know, own native tongues and so on. Um, and then in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48, when they're at Cornelius' Cornelius's house and as Peter is talking, it says that the Spirit uh, was poured out even on the Gentiles, and they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then in Acts 19, Paul, in verses 1 through 7, Paul says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you first believed? And they said, well, we didn't even hear if there's a Holy Spirit. And he said, well, what baptism were you baptized in? And he said, well, we were baptized into John's baptism. And Paul says, well, that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And he says, well, so anyway, so he baptizes them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then it says this, and when Paul placed his hands on them, in verse 6, the Holy Spirit came on them, so they were already born again, but he places his hands on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So, now, I'll just say this, the infilling of the Holy Spirit is the entryway to the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's the entryway. The infilling of the Holy Spirit is the entrance, the entryway to the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't have time to go into it, but there's various types of tongues, the Bible t says. And there's interpretation of tongues. There's speaking in the gift of tongues and then the interpretation of that. There are tongues for intercession. There are tongues for devotion. There are tongues for corporate. There are tongues for missionaries, which is what we predominantly see here in the, um, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, where they hear them in their own native languages and so on. I've heard of testimonies of people from other countries where somebody didn't even know that language and they started speaking it in that language. I remember listening in, in uh, one of our conferences. I think, Pastor Ken, you might have been there in one of our conferences. And uh, there was a, a gentleman, I think it was Tim Enloe, and he was talking about how he, was, um, he would hear this, uh, this, this, this distinct, like, tongue. It was like, Shikamo Baba, Shikamo Baba. And so when they were kids, they used to make fun of the guy that used to speak in tongues because he kept, when he, you know, sometimes tongue sounds very awkward and they would hear this, Shikamo Baba. And because this one guy in their worship service, whenever he would praise God in tongues, it would be like, Shikamo Baba, Shikamo Baba. So they couldn't get that phrase out of their head and they would, as kids, they would make fun of him. And they would go, Shikamo Baba, Shikamo Baba, or, you know. And then one day, they were in this conference like years later. I mean, I don't know if it was 20 years. I don't know how long it was. It was a long time. And they're in this conference. They're in, and I think they're in another country. I think it was in Africa somewhere. And they hear, they hear this, uh, this, I think they heard the Shikamo Baba. Shikamo Baba, what, what is that? And the guy, is, the guy is saying, he says, that's exactly what we heard when we were younger, the Shikamo Baba. What, why is he speaking? What, it turns out that Shikamo Baba was an African dialect. Wow. And what it was saying, when you interpreted it, was, Father, I give you the highest adoration that there is to give. The highest praise and the highest adoration. 
And that's what that Sheikh Mubab actually meant in this African dialect. So these people that were speaking in tongues in, the, in a regular worship service, the one man who kept going, Sheikh Mubaba, she had no idea what he was saying, but he was actually saying in tongues, Father, I give you the highest adoration. I give you the highest praise that there is. So that's how powerful tongues are. So you could be speaking in tongues on the missions field, not even know that you're speaking another person's language. And I've heard of people getting saved that way as well. And Paul talks about that in Corinthians. So, anyway, not to go too much into that, but but I found it interesting that in Zechariah it talks about being filled with the Spirit, and then also tongues is not just the only evidence of being filled with the Spirit, but also prophecy, prophesying. And I wish I had time to get into it, but this whole passage from 67 to 80 is about this song, it's Zechariah's song of redemption, that Jesus finally has come to redeem his people, but it's not to redeem them from their political enemies such as Rome, but to deliver them from sin. That's what he's prophesying. He's prophesying the forgiveness of sins, and this is, and, and, and John the Baptist would be the forerunner in verse 77, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. And, um, and then it says, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. And he's talking about, you know, John there and so on. So anyway, folks, uh, we're out of time. I hope this was a blessing to you.